Hi, good morning. In today's talk, we are going to talk about uh, how the modern combat aircraft are able to defend themselves against missiles. So this is going to be a, a very short, brief presentation at a very high level, just to give you a flavor for different kinds of missiles and how combat airplanes defend against themselves. As before, all the material is obtained from open domain and no claims to originality either explicitly or implicitly is made. So let's start with that. So at the end of this session, uh, you'll be able to you know, describe types of weapons used against combat aircraft, different types and mode of operation of seekers used in missiles, explain modes of engagement during air combat, defensive equipment and measures employed by combat aircraft. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So air combat uh, involves both air-to-air -air missiles and surface-to-air missiles. And at one time, air-to-air -air missiles and surface-to-air missiles were considered omnipotent weapons threatening the manned combat air aircraft. Now, they, it was assumed that you just fire one of these missiles and you can bring down the aircraft. Of course, in reality, uh, guided missiles, uh, whether it is air-to-air -air or surface-to-air, come with various limitations which are inherent in the physics of their respective airframes, their respective power plants and guidance systems. Both anti-aircraft missiles and surface to missiles can be most effective if used appropriately and conversely, the failure to account for no limitations can render them quite futile. For example, uh, during the early 80s, there was a conflict between uh, Britain and Argentina called the Falklands uh, conflict in which the British, uh, the, uh, British UK Air Force used Harriers they carried uh, AIM-N9L, which are all aspect ratio missiles, meaning that they can be fired from head-on or side-on positions. Whereas Argentinian Mirages, older version Mirages, they had R550 Magic MK1, which was uh, you know, not an all aspect heat seeker. It had to target the enemy's engine. So during this conflict, what happened is most of the times the Harriers were able to shoot down the Argentinian Mirages uh, because of this uh, fact that the Argentinian Mirages did not have the right kind of missiles. Almost exactly the same thing happened uh, in a conflict between uh, US Air Force and the Libyan Air Force sometime during the 1981 period. US Air Force was flying F-14A Tomcats and they had all aspect sidewinder missiles along with them. Whereas uh, Muammar Gaddafi's uh, Libyan Air Force had Sukhoi 22 fitters. Uh, they all had what's called AA2 Atoll heat seekers. And these heat seekers as before, as was found in the older uh, magic missiles, were uh, heat seekers and they had to be aimed at the engine's exhaust. Whereas the sidewinders was all aspects. So this is how F-14 were able to shoot down uh, the uh, Sukhoi airplane because of the fact that they had superior missiles. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not only the missiles and equipment, it's also the human beings or the pilots which are important in such a conflict. Uh, as an example, if you take uh, the conflict between um, India and Pakistan, Pakistan had F-86 uh, Sabre jets supplied from the US Air Force. They also had sidewinder missiles, whereas India had only NAT aircraft. Yet, Indian Air Force was able to outmaneuver the, uh, the sidewinders, F-86 side, uh, with sidewinder missiles because of superior uh, you know, pilot training. So while missiles and aircraft are important, the ultimate uh, decision factor would be the man behind the machine or the pilot. In this, uh, we will only refer uh, to guided missiles. We'll confine ourselves to guided missiles, especially in term, in relation to air combat, uh, because you know the the regular unguided rockets, which are simply fired, are like big bullets or the old anti-aircraft guns. Guided missiles themselves are broadly categorized according to their mission, which is generally stated in terms of their launching platform and intended target. Now, launching platform could be an aircraft, it could be a ship or it could be from ground. In such cases, you have air-to-air -air missiles, an aircraft firing missile at another aircraft, air-to-surface missiles, like what was used in Balakot, air-to-ship missiles and ship-to-air missiles, surface-to-surface -surface, and surface-to-air missiles. There are various types of missiles. We are, of course, in this talk, worrying only about anti-aircraft uh, things, so air-to-air -air and surface-to-air missiles. Much of the uh, discussion, of course, is also relevant to other types, especially the surface-to-air missiles. 
And if, before we proceed further, let's have a very, very uh, simplified uh, look at what a missile is. Uh, what we see here is a very highly simplified figure, uh, which kind of depicts any generic guided missile, nothing special. Every missile would have small variations on this, but all of them will have these three components. So depending on design, some of the functions of these subsystems may be assisted or even replaced by equipment located in the platform. So what you see here is a seeker in the nose part of the uh, missile. And this is the one which looks at the target and uh, is able to track the target. Then behind that, you have the guidance section, which uh, issues the requisite uh, instructions for the control surfaces to move, or in some cases, the uh, rocket uh, thrust vectoring, to be able to reach the target. So the guidance section uh, has a very important role to play. It has to look at the target. It has to look at the missile's uh, current flight path and find out the difference between the two and issue correcting um, um, measures and correcting instructions to the control surfaces. Behind that, you have a, a fuse and a warhead section. And these are the ones which, uh, you know, when it could be contact fuse or proximity fuse, which will explode and destroy the target. Then you have uh, control surfaces, movable canards, wings, and things like that. Uh, and then behind that, of course, is the key part of the missile, which is the rocket motor. Most of the anti aircraft missiles, uh, and missiles which are carried on aircraft are use solid propellant rockets. Uh, we'll come to talk to that about that a little later. Depending on uh, you know, some of the things, you know, the guidance, for example, could be uh, taken over from the ground. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, controls also could be from the ground, or everything could be on the launch platform, meaning the aircraft, or on the missile itself. So in order to understand uh, how an aircraft can defend itself against an incoming missile, we first need to understand how missiles see and track their targets. It's basically, if a missile is fired at an aircraft, the missile is able to see the target. See, not exactly as we see uh, uh, human beings see, but the way a, uh, you know, a seeker uh, looks at the target, is able to distinguish between the target from other surrounding things, and then track it to see where the, the flight path of the target. Basically, there are two ways an anti-aircraft missile, anti missile can see their target. One is it can look at the radar signature of the target aircraft, or it can look at the heat signature of the target aircraft. Radar cross-section is the amount of reflected radar energy coming from the aircraft, and the heat signature is the amount of IR emission coming from uh, largely from the engine exhaust, but not only from them, but for other parts of the aircraft as well. Even among these seekers, there are a couple of options. You can have a passive seeker, uh, in which case missile has just a receiver and a sensor. It does not emit any energy or it does not emit any, any wave. And it is simply it's like, you know, just sitting and listening and uh, acquiring um, the signatures from the target aircraft. Or it could be active. In which case missile has a radar transmitter and it's on its own and it uses reflections to track. So these two have their own advantages and disadvantages. Passive seekers are lighter and uh, easy to package into a missile, and they are also difficult to detect. Active missiles are more effective, but they need to have their own radar transmitter, which could actually give them away in the sense they themselves could be tracked by uh, an aircraft. So most of the combat aircraft have their own uh, sensors at the rear part of the fuselage, which uh, you know, warns the pilot that his aircraft is being lit up or is being uh, sought by a missile. So active, uh, active systems can be more effective, but also they are vulnerable. Passive systems are less effective, but uh, less vulnerable also. So it's a question of trade-off and what you want to do. Uh, missiles could be just fired, directed, and controlled from either a ground-based system. And these are referred to as surface-to-air missiles. For example, the S-400, which India is trying to acquire from the uh, Russian uh, defense department is one such thing and uh, of course India itself has developed Akash from the DRDO and the older Russian missile SAM-6 or surface tail missile 6. So these are ones which are fired from the ground towards incoming aircraft. The missiles also could be fired uh, from and controlled by an aircraft called air-to-air -air missiles and these are for example Astra is another uh, DRDO development air-to-air -air missiles. AMRAM is an American missile which was uh, normally used in F-16s and this, of course, became a kind of uh, famous during this uh, recent uh, 
skirmish between Indian Air Force and the Pakistan Air Force. And the Indians claimed that the Pakistanis had fired an AMRAAM missile, and which means that they had used an F-16, which need not have been or should not have been used. So that apart. And uh, it, it means that this can be fired from an aircraft. Missiles could also be fire and forget type where, you know, once it is locked onto a target, you don't really need to do anything. The missile eats on its own. It's an autonomous thing. And some of these missiles are also beyond visual range in the sense uh, the pilot actually need not see the uh, target aircraft. Uh, he, the radar acquisition happens, the missile is fired and uh, it could be even 100 kilometers away, 200 kilometers away, the target. So these kind of things uh, are in use. An understanding uh, of uh, weapons capabilities and how to deal with them has enormous impact on the combat effectiveness. Basically, if you look at uh, any missile, they have something called a, a kill probability or P bracket A, which is of course a probability of succeeding in shooting the target. Early missiles in you know, the 1960s and 70s had a kill probability of about 15%, meaning if you fire 100 missiles, only 15 of them may most likely to hit a target. Uh, and there's of course a pop, you know, probability, it's not uh, you know, anything concrete about it. But modern missiles have improved their kill probability uh, from 15 to 60 percent, so that they are becoming more deadly. Of course, there is no such thing as a 100 percent uh, kill probability missile. All missiles can be defeated. And for, to defeat them, you need to understand uh, their weaknesses, their limitations. And this will help the uh, combat pilot to take appropriate action. Each and every missile has its weakness. And this weakness comes largely from the propulsion unit, from the airframe and the structural unit, and from the guidance which is guiding the missile. So if a good understanding is there of how each one of this, then the combat aircraft is uh, able to survive or the pilot can survive. So let's start looking at uh, missile vulnerabilities one by one. Let's start off with the propulsion. Uh, this is one of the key limitations of any missiles or also the key capabilities. It's both the plus and the minus part of the missile. Most current uh, anti-aircraft missiles or air launch missiles employ solid rocket propulsion because of a very high thrust to weight ratio, compact size, and they can be uh, fired at uh, very, very short notice because uh, you, know, you don't have to load uh, any uh, fuel or an oxidizer if it's a liquid propellant thing. So most of them use uh, solid propellant uh, rockets, but solid propellant rockets, as we all know, have a limited uh, specific impulse, maybe uh, roughly about 280 to 260 to 280 seconds, not more than that. So for short range uh, anti-aircraft missiles, most of them use uh, solid propellant rockets. A uh, typical thrust profile is that of a very high initial impulse burn to accelerate it to cruise speed, then followed by a slower sustainer burn. So this is the idea is to very quickly get the missile into air uh, at a very high and give it a very high kinetic energy, and then a slower sustainer uh, burn phase where the tracking and guidance can happen. Once the propellant is burned out, of course, the airframe will coast uh, like any, uh, any uh, ballistic thing like, you know, uh, a bullet or a stone thrown, but eventually drag will take over and then it will lose its kinetic energy and uh, it will eventually fall down to earth if it is not uh, going to hit the target. So the maneuverability or the ability to change its path and course of uh, such a missile depends largely on the lift to drag ratio it is able to generate and its maximum uh, speeds. Initial stages, of course, when it is just launched, the speeds are low because it has to start from zero velocity. Since the uh, speeds are low, uh, the dynamic pressure is low and because of the, the control power is low. See, uh, remember all the control surfaces like canards or wings or tails uh, depend a large extent on the dynamic pressure. So the initial stages when the velocities are slow, uh, the control power is low, hence their maneuvering ability is limited. Their maneuverability will be highest, uh, close to highest, just uh, close to the sustainer burnout. When the initial boost has happened, sustainer is burning and that too is close to burnout. That's when the missile has maximum kinetic energy. It's very close to its Vmax. And still some amount of thrust is available. Uh, of course, after the sustainer burnout happens, the missile starts to lose its energy and ability to follow thorough maneuver. So if an aircraft can outlast the missile or its burner, sustainer burn time, then it can, of course, succeed in evading the missiles. 
Uh, missiles range also depends on altitude because you know with increasing altitude the density uh, goes down significantly and the density goes down the drag goes down since missiles don't depend so much on generating lift and uh, uh, things like that lift is not uh, affected so much with the increasing altitude and because they lower drag there is a significant improvement in the performance so a typical number which is often quoted in textbooks and in um, technical literature is a factor of two improvement between sea level and six kilometers altitude. Meaning that if this uh, system uh, range had a range of 50 kilometers at sea level, it will probably have close to 90 to 100 when it is fired at six kilometers altitude. This of course applies to air to air missiles, ground to air missiles of course, this logic doesn't hold. And another thing is when a missile is fired, uh, visual signature of smoke, plume and other what's called contrail is a giveaway. This can be detected from uh, you know airborne early warning systems. So the smoke or the smoke trails uh, have been reduced greatly in modern weapons such as AMRAM. Uh, they can't completely be eliminated. There will be a smoke. Uh, in the 70s uh, and uh, late uh, 70s, uh, there was uh, program to develop two specific propellants called HMX and RDX and these were called high melting uh, smokeless propellants and the idea of this smokeless high melting propellants used to be used in uh, missiles uh, such that their uh, the smoke trail is uh, very minimal in account and they also have pretty high energy. Unfortunately these two uh, propellants seem to be more popular among uh, uh, the you know terrorists and jihadists rather than in the missiles things. Uh, the, if you look at the different phases of flight of a missile, the first phase is the boost phase at launch where it is accelerated to high speed in the general direction of the target. Okay, So there is, a, let's say there is a warning that there is an incoming aircraft and the uh, air defense system is activated and the launch is happens and the booster fires the missiles and accelerates to the highest speed in the general direction of the target by the axial rocket booster using thrust vector control initially to follow a pre-computed trajectory. As in when the velocity builds up of course then uh, there will be enough uh, dynamic pressure for it, other control mechanisms to happen. After its booster burns out the missile enters into a, what's called a mid-course phase of flight gliding at high speed on a pre-calculated radar updated appropriate intercept course. Now when I see pre-calculated radar updated, this is either from its onboard radar or from the ground based system. Uh, so the ground based system or onboard system is continuously tracking the target, continuously updating its position, finding out the difference between each and uh, issuing appropriate uh, control uh, commands for it to go towards the intercept, <coughs> towards the intended target. Uh, missile does not track its target during a mid course. The mid course phase serves to fly the missile in a acquisition basket from where it can acquire the target. So what it means is uh, its tracking mechanism is not uh, activated in, uh, during this phase. It's simply going in the direction uh, indicated by the pre-calculated and radar updated approximate path. So as and when it goes, it's going in the, uh, let's say it's a conical acquisition basket and the diameter of the cone starts reducing and gets closer and closer to the target uh, with the onboard. When it is close to that, it switch on its onboard homing. So after booster burnout, the missile enters the terminal phase, also called the homing phase or end game, where it is guided by changing the direction, not the magnitude of its velocity vector, because that is uh, not possible. Inside the atmosphere, uh, when it is, let's say, uh, within about 20 to uh, less than 20 kilometers altitude, uh, there is enough density in the air and some dynamic pressure is available. So the control uh, and uh, things can be done by tails, wings and canards. But if the missile goes outside the atmosphere, uh, that which can of course happen uh, uh, quite often, the missiles uh, then have to manipulate their thrust for homing uh, because the control surfaces won't be as effective as they are inside the atmosphere. So the other that was the vulnerabilities in propulsion. Now let's look at the vulnerabilities coming in from airframe. Controls of a missile impose structural and aerodynamic performance limitations. Okay, most missiles employ a combination of wing and body lift 
to provide a maximum turn rate with the minimum energy bleed. What we mean by energy bleed is that if the missile has a certain number of kinetic energy and a certain number of potential energy, it would like to do a turn without uh, compromising on either one of them too much. So throughout all these phases of file, while maximizing its range, most of them use control forces to turn the like aircraft, and these are proportioned, of course, to dynamic pressure, meaning V square. So even missiles, cruise speeds, maneuverability is limited due to the airframe's G limit, or the you know the amount of uh, uh, structural load factor which is there, which is gone into the design. And most you know manned pile, uh, manned aircraft, uh, as we all know, have a G limitation of. Uh, plus of nine and a negative of minus three, missiles can have a J limits close to even 20 to 30 or even higher. That depends on the airframe structure, okay? And also its angle of attack limit surface is very small lifting surfaces which are there in canards and things like that. Uh, some new missiles use thrust vector control and radial maneuvering thrusters which are more effective than the older missiles. Uh, of course, these can't maneuver once the propellant is burnt out. So if they are dependent mainly on thrust vector control, once the propellant is burnt, uh, this control mechanism is gone. So if you can outlast the missile till its uh, propellant is burnt out, the aircraft can survive. The other vulnerability is coming from guidance and control. How is the missile guided towards the target? So the guidance implements fundamental control loss designed for the vehicles. Control loss meaning for each degree of the reflection of the control surface, what is the expected moment and the side on the uh, correcting forces. So these control loss based on the missile geometry. It translates the perceived motion of the target into control commands which alter the airframe's flight path to achieve a hit. So to best way to understand this is imagine you, uh, you are a soccer player and your friend gives you a pass from some other direction. Uh, you don't chase the ball. You run in the direction where you think the ball is going to be when you reach that uh, location. Basically, you are continuously seeing the ball uh, moving and you're also moving and your friend also is moving. And when uh, the pass is made, you anticipate where the ball is going to be at a certain period of time and go and intercept that. So this is how uh, the missiles also work. They continuously track the target and they uh, look at their own velocities and angle and all those hidings and then find the difference between the two and try to correct it. Now these things uh, are depending on the uh, different classes of weapon, uh, this guidance and control. Uh, the major categories are, there are many more, but major crucial ones are command link, beam riding and homing. Command link is common medium and large surface to air missile types, particularly for mid-course correction, although often it has been uh, used all the way when jamming has degraded the terminal. Command link comes from the ground. Okay, so the ground is continuously tracking the target and is sending command uh, uh, information right up to the, uh, the missile. Generally, uh, this is it will until the missile takes over. And if its missile homing device is jammed by the uh, aircraft, then this uh, it will continue to use the ground-based command. So the other one is uh, the beam riding. It involves beaming the of steering commands from the launch site. Launch site could be ground, a platform, or whichever is the aircraft which is firing that, uh, which is equipped with radar and optical tracking system. Basically, there is a, a home system. Uh, which could be on ground or on the aircraft, which is tracking the uh, target and then sending corrective measures right up to the missiles. So missile itself uh, may or may not have its own uh, devices, but this uh, will simply ride on the beam of command sent by the launch profession. A variation of this uh, technique is command to line of sight or CLOS, CLOS often used with point defense surface to air missiles. Point defense means there is a specific area you would like to, let's say, defend, uh, and that uh, the missiles are around that, and these uh, have command to line of sight. Uh, some examples are Javelin and Rapier and Sea Wolf. These are the common uh, missiles which employ this kind of uh, guidance. A similar technique uh, as beam riding, when a missile maintains itself within a microwave or a laser beam which tracks the intended target. It's like, you know, somebody is giving you a pathway, uh, like, a, you know, imagine a, a tube which is in which you have to continuously be moving. And of course, this is not a physical uh, tube, it's a, a beam of a microwave or laser, whatever is being used. 
And uh, all the time, uh, such missiles employ tail sensors to sense changes in beam direction. And uh, some of the missiles which are of this type are RBS-70 and uh, blow pipe man portable SAMs or man pads as they are called. And these, you know, are controlled uh, by the, uh, the launching system. And some of them are also wire guided. Uh, generally, anti-tank missiles are wire guided, but not the aircraft ones. A more effective and expensive, but expensive technique is called homing. Uh, homing, of course, you can have passive, semi-active, and active. Homing, passive homing missiles track the emissions of the target. Basically, typically heat seekers, uh, like you know the what I mentioned about uh, the Sukhoi 22 in the uh, Libyan conflict or the Mirages uh, 3s in the Falklands conflict, they had heat seekers. Okay, and these uh, look at the targets maximum heat uh, or heat emission coming from and then of course they home on to that or it could be anti-radiation missiles in a sense radiation coming from the, uh, the aircraft's own radar. Major drawbacks of passive homing is its dependence on a cooperative target that continues to emit the energy required for homing. Basically uh, you are expecting the target aircraft to, to simply keep on uh, running in front of you so that this missile is able to track its engine and go and impact. If the target aircraft make, takes evasive maneuvers, then this missile's effectiveness is gone. So another step up in that is the semi-active homing uh, missiles, which avoid this problem by having a missile home on to reflected energy that's provided by another source, often the launch platform. When you, let's say you launch your missiles from an aircraft. The aircraft is illuminating the target with their own radar and this uh, missile is uh, homing onto the reflected. So even if the target aircraft takes evasive measures, it, it's still being eliminated by uh, the base aircraft and the missile will simply keep following. So this active homing uh, weapons eliminate, some of the missiles have their own uh, um, transmitters and radar things. They can uh, eliminate their own targets and track their targets. Of course, the effectiveness of homing weapons depends uh, largely on the seeker, airframe, and power plant performance. The seeker is the one which is, has to be sensitive enough uh, to be able to hit the target. So now let's look at the some of the vulnerabilities one has seen in seekers. Homing missiles uh, attempt to match the rate of change of missiles flight path direction to the rate of change of the line of sight between the target and the missile. Basically what you're seeing is, let's say uh, there is a target which is moving. Uh, of course, uh, he's not going to, uh, the aircraft is not going to stay in the same path for the missiles to go and uh, hit it. So the aircraft can do different maneuvers. So what a homing device does is based on what the uh, target aircraft is doing, the missiles also do keep doing the same kind of uh, changes and, and to ensure that the target uh, is always within its sight. And one of the techniques used is called proportional navigation. This is a very uh, sim simple to implement and as it doesn't uh, require range information and also tends to tail chase its target, which is advantageous to heat seekers. So proportional navigation is one of the techniques. Seeker types employed on homing missiles have basic limitations, uh, of course, which are common to all types, whether radar or infrared or laser. The range of a seeker will depend on its sensitivity it's uh, atmospheric attenuation, background, uh, you know, infrared or laser clutter, uh, for example, uh, background clutter, uh, and the amount of energy emitted by the target. Uh, and uh, all these uh, will affect the sensitivity of the seeker. And these can be exploited by the aircraft to evade this kind of uh, missiles. Radar seekers uh, are least effective at low level because of ground clutter. So if the aircraft uh, descends to a very low altitude and start flying close to treetops, I mean, not exactly treetops, maybe 100, 200 feet above the ground, uh, when the, uh, the missile is uh, you know, seeking its uh, radar uh, signature, what it gets is a lot of reflections from uh, coming from movable objects or immovable objects like you know, buildings, trees, mountains, and other uh, vehicles. So the, the seeker is, will not be able to distinguish the target from all the uh, surrounding uh, you know, radar noise. So one of the ways this can be uh, addressed is if the missile has what's called a Doppler processor. So this can Doppler uh, filter can differentiate between static and moving objects. 
if this missile has that, then of course this technique of flying close to the ground uh, will not be much use because they are able to di differentiate between static and moving. Now heat seekers are least effective over hot terrain. For example, if you are flying over a hot rocky terrain on a bright sunny day, uh, the infrared coming from your engine kind of merges with the kind of uh, infrared emissions coming from uh, heated rocks or the sun or even the clouds and everything like that. So then what happens is uh, the aircraft will lose its lock on the air, uh, the missile will lose its lock on the aircraft because of the surrounding uh, noise. From the perspective of trying to define homing missiles, one of the most common factors is the set of limitation imposed uh, by seeker motion limits. So seeker itself has a field of vision and uh, if you uh, are able to exploit their uh, small field of vision then the aircraft can survive. So every seeker as I said has a field of view. This is essentially a solid angle between the airframe's longitudinal axis beyond which the seeker cannot point. It's like, you know, uh, even for human beings, even though of course human beings, field of view is more than 180 degrees, but still, if it is beyond 180 degrees, even human beings cannot see. So as long, and this missiles of seekers, of course, their solid angle is much, much smaller. And uh, once you get out of that uh, field of view of the missile, in that uh, solid angle, the, the, uh, the, the missile will miss the target. So if a maneuver carries a target outside the field of view, before the airframe adjusts its direction, lock is broken and the missile is defeated. So standard initial defensive maneuvers uh, would be to hard break turn, uh, meaning that if you are flying in one direction, suddenly take a very, very sharp turn uh, and of course either climb or lose altitude. Essentially, you are trying to get out of that uh, field of view. Okay, And uh, if the uh, missile is a little slow in reacting or adjusting its uh, uh, longitude and corrective, you will be uh, quickly out of their uh, line of sight and uh, that means that uh, you are safe. Changing aspect uh, introduces jitter and uh, rotates the tail pipe away from the threat. So this is also another uh, method which is uh, followed. Changing aspect introduces, you know, a jitter. It's some Similarly, any sudden change in velocity can adversely affect the Doppler rock. Sudden change in velocity can happen when the pilot suddenly pulls up uh, the nose up without increasing the thrust. So the velocity drops very rapidly. And then if the missile was having a Doppler filter which was based on which it had locked onto the target, it may mistake uh, this for something else and miss the aircraft. So this is one of the techniques which are followed. And uh, it's believed that the Cobra maneuver, which has been uh, so dramatically shown by Su guys is one of the ways to break a Doppler block. Of course, this has to be uh, proved in actual combat. You know, theoretically, you can uh, explain it away, but I'm not sure whether it works in actual combat. Uh, and uh, if you look at the seekers, the seeker system of missile is responsible for sensing and tracking the target, providing the information necessary for performance of a guidance system. Preset and command guidance uh, do not require a seeker in the missile since the tracking function is accomplished by the launching and guidance platform, which could be, as I said earlier, the mother aircraft or could be the ground-based system. Maximum range of uh, seeker operation often limits the effective range of a missile system. Uh, so that's where there is a lot of development money and research, money spent and research done in the seeker development. And Passive seekers, of course, have an inherent advantage here because their received power is inversely proportional to the square of the target's range. Okay, and since it is passive, they uh, they are not expending any energy. So while uh, so that way, that's better. While the maximum range of an active or a semi-active system varies inversely as the fourth power. Okay, now if you are just uh, receiving, then your uh, proportional to the square of the target range. If it is an active, then it is power inversely proportional to the uh, fourth power of the target. So that means uh, an active system uh, effectiveness fades very, very rapidly with increasing distance, unlike the passive one. So the most common passive seeker now in use is the heat seeker. This is basically a device which contains a material, the detector, which is sensitive to heat, infrared, uh, IR radiation that is produced primarily by the target's propulsion systems 
Uh, but of course, may other systems also because, because of aerodynamic heating and all that. But large amount of it comes from the propulsion system, meaning the uh, nozzle exhaust. The detector is often cryogenically cooled to eliminate internally generated thermal noise and allow detection of even very small amounts of higher energy coming from an external source. So it's not simply a very simple device. It has to be pretty complex and quite a challenging thing to develop. Because, you know, the amount of IR energy which comes from a target at 60 kilometers, uh, you know, not 60, maybe 10, 15 kilometers away, uh, along with the, all the sunlight and everything else uh, needs to be uh, detected. So then the seeker has to be extremely sensitive. And when if you more, more sensitive means you have to eliminate its own local uh, noise coming from where it is uh, housed. So these kind of things uh, are very, very challenging. And uh, that's why they are cryogenically cooled. And uh, also the speaker... A seeker must have still have the capability to discriminate between target radiation and background radiation. Okay, so this is the crucial part of, uh, of a, a seeker. Uh, here is a, a, a depiction I have uh, taken from a textbook, uh, where the resolution uh, is just uh, you know you can say some kind of a depiction. If uh, if you take a, a cone, okay, and uh, in a, at a distance of uh, twenty about twenty kilometers, and the seeker uh, will produce a one pixel dot on a 256 by 256 uh, uh, you know, screen. So at a 20 kilometers distance, it will produce one pixel. At a 10 to 20 kilometers, less than that, then it produces two pixels. So when it is up close to five kilometers, it produces eight pixels. As you can see, it takes a lot of uh, uh, evidence, I know not a lot of uh, effort to develop a very, very sensitive. The more sensitive it is, the more will be the picture on the radar screen and the better it will be for uh, identification and tracking. So the passive defense uh, the, uh, also is part of the way aircraft designers stay, uh, you know, do something. So aircraft designers basically can decrease the fighter or combat aircraft's vulnerability to missile attack by using many camouflage and suppression techniques. For example, uh, they can include uh, re reducing the radar's uh, reflectivity by using methods, which I think I have already covered in low observables, uh, trying to reduce the radar signature by either non-reflecting shapes and materials and or together with radar absorbing paint, whenever it is practical, or wherever it is practical to apply the radar absorbing paint. Reflectivity is also sensitive to engine inlet design, unfortunately. Uh, as uh, we all know, if I try to reduce the uh, reflection from the engine's compressor phase, the intake becomes serpentine and that leads to uh, aircraft's aerodynamic uh, penalties. IR signatures can be suppressed by using special jet nozzle designs, by uh, monitoring exhaust placement, by using engines with cooler exhaust, and by adding chemicals to the exhaust or also by using maybe a low bypass engine because a bypass uh, turbofan engine has a cooler air surrounding the hotter jet and uh, most combat airplanes uh, now have a very low bypass uh, turbofans because of the fuel uh, efficiency and which leads directly to increased uh, range and endurance and the bypass air also helps in reducing the infrared signature. Optical tracking itself can be made difficult by camouflaging techniques that reduce the aircraft's contrast with the background. Of course, this technique used to be there in the World War II time, where they didn't have much of electronic uh, detection. Basically, you know, this is people watching from the ground, uh, watching uh, with their heads lifted to the sky. So then uh, the different kind of paint schemes were employed. They, of course, they, are, they still continue to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Hoping that it, for example, some of the aircraft have this green and yellow patches on them on the top of the aircraft so that if somebody sees from the top, they will kind of merge with the uh, landscape of uh, uh, forest. And another way is to generate uh, line of sight rates that exceed the shooter's turn capability. Basically, as I said, the seeker has a, a field of view which is a solid uh, conical angle. And if you can do a maneuver which takes you quickly out of that cone, then of course uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ability for the missile to track you or hit you is reduced. So essentially maneuvering is one of the primary defenses against weapons with limited aspect 
capability such as rear quarter heat seekers. Now, one of the things which normally uh, pilots talk about, if they are being uh, uh, sought by a heat seeking missile from the rear, they tend to fly towards the sun and then suddenly drop out of sight. So the missile looks at the IR radiation from the sun, which is of course certainly large, much larger than coming from the engine, then tends to lose its uh, target. Uh, of course, it is uh, such kind of activities cannot be done very effectively against all aspect missiles. All aspect missile, which what it means is that the uh, the uh, the enemy aircraft which is trying to fire a missile towards you uh, need not actually get behind you. They can even be head on or side on and still fire missiles, and that will be able to attack you. In such cases, uh, maneuvering yourself out of uh, their line of fight is not that uh, effective. That easy to do as it is if it's just a tail uh, tail chasing uh, heat seeking missile. Uh, the active homing systems provide a source of eliminating energy on the missile itself. So basically the missile carries a, a small a laser targeter or a, a radar eliminate, uh, emitter which uh, the missile carries and of course this requires a more complex and larger more expensive missiles and these are not cheap uh, and in some ways it's simpler and more reliable because they have their own uh, systems and you just launch and leave, fire and forget as they are called. So one disadvantage however is the possibility of reduced target detection and target ranges because detection and range finding depends on the amount of uh, radar power you have, what is the power of transmission power and how much is the power rec uh, received. But if this, this system is on the missile, then because of the size of the missile limitations, they, they have a, uh, limitations on the kind of power they can transmit or even the kind of uh, power uh, tracking they can do. Maximum range of radar systems uh, using a given power and the level of technology is roughly proportional to the area of the antenna. So bigger the antenna, more sensitive they are. But uh, missile sizes being what they are, they can only have a a very uh, small antenna compared to what is a launching aircraft can have or a ground based system can have. So this could be uh, their, uh, you know, you can actually scale or their limitations. Um, in this, there are some semi-active radar homing missiles. It uh, homes on a radar signal created by the launching aircraft on which it is based. So basically it has only a receiver. The transmission power is coming from the mother aircraft which fires it. Active radar homing missiles have their own small radar and seeker and that is, as I said, you know, usually activated towards the terminal phase where they are very close to the target because, you know, the distance, uh, larger distance, the onboard uh, transmitter receiver is not very effective because, as I said, it goes like inverse power of the distance. Uh, the missile is fitted with a radar receiver. So when the launching plane eliminates its target with uh, his radar, the missile gets the signature and can go to the, towards the target. Some more advanced missiles you know, have their own little uh, emitters which are not very things. Heat signature uh, missile is fitted with a heat seeker and will follow the heat source it was assigned by the launching uh, plane before firing. So now let's start looking at what well, we have looked at the vulnerabilities and the abilities of the missiles. Now let's start looking at how to defend against that. Okay, there are different kinds of uh, defense, uh, electronic defense, for example. In that, we have uh, what is called a noise. Uh, a broad classification of defensive technique is known as electronic countermeasures or ECMs. These methods can be divided into two categories, a noise and deception. Noise jamming is an attempt to produce a strong signal that will overpower uh, the target return when it is received by the enemy radar. So to give you a very simple uh, but a crude analogical example, Let's say I am talking in towards this uh, you know, video in here. Suppose you had another person sitting uh, next to me or close to me shouting at the top of his voice. So while my voice is also recorded, his voice also will be recorded. And in the cacophony, you may not be able to distinguish my voice or you may not be able to identify what is being said by me. So this is a very crude analogy. So what the thing is that you generate a lot of noise in different frequencies so that the receiver kind of gets confused between the things. So in this such a case, the attacker ideally obtains a very strong return from the line of sight of the target, but the noise obscures the target. 
So if the target uh, amount of energy is lost in the overall noise, just like as I said, no, uh, my voice will be lost in somebody who is shouting behind me or some bunch of guys shouting behind me. Doppler radars uh, can't be fooled, of course, by this technique um, since they do not require pulse timing. So Doppler radars uh, are ones with missiles with uh, Doppler filters in them and they cannot be uh, do that because whatever noise I create, uh, they will have a different uh, uh, velocities and things like that. So that is, they cannot be fooled by that. Another um, method effectiveness jam noise jamming is related to the ratio of the jamming power received by the enemy radar to the strength of the target return. So if the target, if my aircraft is going to return a certain amount of uh, uh, radar, uh, the amount of power back to the uh, seeker, then my jamming should be more than that. Okay, or uh, the same level, so that I, I, there's a confusing return which comes to the seeker. Since reflected target energy is much more sensitive to target range than is the received noise, this method is very effective at long distances. So, if there is a big distance between the missile and the aircraft, this kind of uh, jamming is pretty useful. Noise is also more effective, it can be concentrated in a narrow beam uh, at the enemy radar. Okay, and which means that you have a, a radio beam kind of thing which is uh, turned towards the uh, missile. Uh, maybe if jamming may be done by the target itself or by a standoff jammer which attempts to conceal other aircraft with its noise. <coughs> Excuse me. Now all of you must have seen about uh, the Boeing's loyal wingman aircraft which autonomously takes off and lands. And this is supposed to go along with uh, the other fighter planes. And this uh, loyal wingman can be used as standoff jammer because uh, it's not uh, supposed to be doing anything else. It's either trying to confuse the incoming missile. Uh, it could be a jamming or it could be a tracker. It could be any one of these. Deception jamming uh, involves many techniques, including the generation of a false targets and causing radars to lose the automatic uh, tracking lock. False targets may be produced by delaying or altering the characteristics of the reflecting energy. For example, shaft or decoy shafts are small, uh, you know, pieces of metal, uh, scrap metal, and if they are suddenly thrown off from the aircraft or dispensed from the aircraft, they too reflect the radar waves, and in that, uh, in the, you know, mass of radar reflections, it becomes very difficult for the seeker to target the uh, aircraft or to distinguish the aircraft from the, or differentiate the aircraft from the existing noise. Shafts or decoys or other things which are uh, small uh, rockets which are fired and uh, they move away from the parent aircraft and they can, uh, their reflections also can confuse the tracker. One of the earliest forms of electronic countermeasures was called shaft. Generally, large quantities of radar reflecting material, often small lengths of foil or wire, more than 40 years after its first use in World War II, it is still among the simplest and the most cost-effective techniques. All you need to do is uh, load it with you know, a dispenser, which explosively dispenses this foil and wire, and then, of course, it confuses the uh, incoming radar. Of course, shafts uh, cannot defeat infrared missiles. They are only designed to uh, defeat the radar, radar frequency seeker missiles. A uh, radar ground-based or enemy-based sends out electromagnetic signals. If they are being reflected back to the radar, they show up as a dot. This can be an aircraft, but also can be a lot of birds. Shafts are often a small pieces of material, aluminum, metallized, glass fiber, plastic, no, a lot of other materials are coming to reduce the weight. And when they reflect radar waves in different directions, there is a whole lot of confusion at the receiving station. But uh, there is a weakness in this. So when the aircraft spreads a big cloud of shaft, they, they work uh, like a curtain or show up on the radar. And behind the mass of darts, aircraft is hidden. But the one uh, disadvantage of this uh, is, I'll talk, talk about that a little later. Their goal is to disrupt the attacker's radar so that he cannot guide his missile or it will glide onto the shaft and not def uh, defending the defending uh, plane. Of course, they do not produce any smoke are really difficult to see visually, so they are not very effective against IR. The com most common metal based and is metal based is effective, uh, reflective, designed to create a field of reflection, capture radar receiver. However, they are not foolproof as their velocity drops from the ambient uh, velocity within a few seconds. Uh, so because they don't have their own propulsive power, the moment uh, they are dispensed from the aircraft, they are at the velocity of the aircraft, which is very high, 
Uh, so, eventually, essentially means that the drag these shaft uh, foils and wires have is very, very high and so very rapidly they lose their velocity. And within few seconds, uh, they are completely uh, very low velocity. So, metastatic rudder and other techniques may see around through them. So, if there is a Doppler filter, then it can distinguish between rapidly slowing down shaft and uh, you know, uh, consistently flying aircraft. So, and, um, metastatic or you know, radar which is kept somewhere else, uh, the receiver is kept somewhere else and the transmitter is in different place. And these can, of course, not be fooled by shaft. So, here is just a picture of, of, of taken from the internet which an aircraft dispensing shafts. So, what you can see here is small pieces of metallic foils or even metallized, uh, you know, polyester sheets or, you know, plastic and things like that, whichever is a good reflector of uh, radar waves. So, what is seen because of the shaft, uh, the, uh, of course, this is a highly uh, dramatized picture of what you can see in the radar screen because of shaft. But the idea is to show you that there is aircraft reflection somewhere here in between and it's almost impossible to detect it with all the kind of noise which is there around it. Infrared seekers uh, are the one of the oldest seekers available and uh, they are designed to track a strong source of infrared radiation uh, jet engine in a most modern military aircraft. So, when they receive a signal based on a source of infrared radiation with higher intensity than the target, it may overwhelm their original uh, infrared signal from the aircraft and provide incorrect steering cues to the missile. So, the uh, what we are trying to do is my jet engine, the aircraft jet engine is producing a certain amount of infrared signature. If by some way I can generate an infrared signature at a higher level than that, by as I said earlier, by flying towards the sun and the missile turns towards the sun and it is overwhelmed by the sun's infrared or the aircraft can use what are called flares. So, the flares are small rocket motors which emit very, very bright and very high temperature flames and this can confuse the seeker, seeker of the radar to lock on to a new infrared source that is rapidly moving away from the true target. Okay, so, uh, the aircraft fires, uh, you know, a flare and uh, the missile, incoming missile looks at the flare which is at a higher infrared signature and it tries to lock on to that. And uh, they are of course used uh, to distract heat seeking missiles. Uh, most are common magnesium pellets ejected from tubes to ignite on the wake of, in the wake behind the aircraft. These flares, you know, burn at temperatures above 2000 degrees Kelvin hotter than the jet exhaust nozzles or exhaust or exhibit larger amount of infrared light. Older IR seekers were designed to go after the highest or uh, the hottest source, hence flares were effective in deflecting them. Modern IR seekers uh, may have their own countermeasures. For example, they can have what are called color filters, meaning wavelengths depend on object temperature. So, as mentioned above, the flare temperature is 2000 degrees, the uh, jet exhaust temperature is around 900 degrees Kelvin. So, each one of them affect, transmits waves at different wavelengths. So, if I can have a, a color filter or a two color filter or whatever like that, then I will be able to distinguish between the aircraft and the missile. Another one is a Doppler filter. Uh, their wavelength depends on the object velocity. Now, the aircraft is already flying at a velocity V, a flare is fired from that and that uh, is at a higher velocity. So, again, a Doppler filter can distinguish uh, between the two of them. So, this is, uh, you know, while the aircraft uh, manufacturers go ahead and improve their aircraft to defend against missiles, uh, missile developers are also doing the same thing. So, there is a picture of some of the flares uh, exhibited as a set, again a picture taken uh, from the internet and you can see that these are very, very bright spots compared to the, the jet which is coming from that uh, aircraft. And these are decoy flares uh, used uh, very uh, effectively uh, by large aircraft. In this case, it is not a combat airplane, it is a bomber kind of thing and it has enough uh, flares to distract so that uh, the, uh, the fighters escorting this are safeguarded. So, that brings me to the end of this uh, very brief presentation on how combat aircraft can defend themselves against missiles by exploiting their weaknesses, by understanding how they see the target or by looking at uh, different uh, abilities of the missiles. Okay, and thank you for listening.